You're listening to Raceway Ministries Today. Thanks for joining us for Raceway Ministries today. In just a few moments, we're going to give you the latest of what's going on in motorsports outreach through the National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries. I would like to welcome everyone to today's edition of Raceway Ministries Today. We're glad to have you with us on this Friday morning of March. It's March 19th, and we have a great discussion that we're looking at today. I'm excited today to have Butch Rhodes with us. Butch lives in Jonesboro, Tennessee, and for a long time, uh, he has been part of the Raceway Ministries team there at Bristol Motor Speedway up there in Tennessee. Butch also is co-director of Bristol Raceway Ministries along with Bobby Branch up there in the Bristol area and we're very very thankful for all that they do up there at Bristol Motor Speedway and we're very thankful to have Butch with us on today's podcast. So Butch good to have you here. How are you doing this morning? Doing great Roger. Glad to be with you. Hey it's great to be with you too. I've always enjoyed being up there in Bristol with you guys at some of the race events at Bristol Motor Speedway and always enjoyed my time together hanging out with you and the others and then also we've had opportunities to be together at lots of annual meetings with the National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries, so it's good to be with you today. Uh, For all of our listeners, uh, we are part of the National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries, and if you need to get in touch with us and connect with us, you can do that in a variety of ways. You can reach me at rogermarsh13 at gmail.com, or you can connect with us through Facebook. We're on Facebook at National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries. And then that same name is the name of our YouTube channel where you can go and you can listen to all kinds of podcasts and pick up some videos there. Or you can just go to our website, racewayministries.org. Well, Butch, uh, Bristol Motor Speedway. Wow, what a history for that place. It's always been a very, very special place. If you're standing there in the middle of Bristol Motor Speedway and you look up to the grandstands, there's some signage there that says the world world's fastest half mile and I don't think there's any reason not to believe that at all because some great racing has taken place there on that half mile which has the high banks there at Bristol Motor Speedway. They've always said Rubbin's racing and a lot of that happens there at Bristol Motor Speedway as well. It's a fantastic place. Butch, I'm sure you can recall with me uh, back in the 1990s and the early 2000s there were sellout crowds and waiting list for tickets. I remember driving through Bristol on race weekends and there'd be people standing everywhere wanting tickets to get into the race and that place would be absolutely buzzing. So busy, busy place and a very, very popular place. I'm sure you've been to a few races there. Uh, Any races that you've attended there other than being with Raceway Ministries? Earlier, before my involvement with Raceway Ministries, was there a couple of times for racing with friends, but just a couple of times, I guess the last time I was there, I went with a friend of mine in 1993, and then after that, it was a while. It was like 1999 before I became involved with Raceway Ministries. All right. I, I guess it's always been that way with the big crowds and the excitement and I mean the whole town seems to get involved in racing when it happens there. What a popular popular raceway. How long has that kind of popularity characterized the Bristol area with NASCAR racing in town? I guess you could say not quite from the start but it kind of built up from that. It was pretty popular back uh, even when they were just had seating for like 30 or 40 thousand you know. Okay. Would usually have pretty good crowds and then once Bruton Smith bought it and did the improvements that he did. It just seemed like that was at the particular time in NASCAR itself when uh, NASCAR was gaining a lot of popularity, not just in the South, but other areas, you know. And yeah. It just kind of grew with the sport, but for whatever reason, I guess maybe it's the local short track routes that people seem to favor that it just grew. Oh, yeah. Well, it's uh, continued to be popular. I don't think the popularity at uh, Bristol has waned any at all through 
through the years. It just seems to be an exciting place for racing. I know my first trip there was back in 2003. I went there for an annual meeting of the National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries not too long after I became director of the group. And then after that, uh, several trips up there for race weekends, both the night race in August and then the uh, early spring race in March. And wow, I was just blown away uh, by the popularity and the excitement. You know, I'm not sure what's made Bristol special through the years. The racers love it. They love to go there and they love to win. Fans have been drawn to it like kids to a candy store for a long, long time. And I guess you're probably right. What's contributed to the big draw is just that excitement of short track racing. And especially there at Bristol with the high banks, they get to going pretty fast around that track. And there's a lot of rubbing, a lot of racing, and a lot of intimidating going on there. I remember back in the day when Dale Earnhardt spun Terry Labonte out for a win there. And uh, when he was interviewed, uh, they asked him why he spun Terry Labonte out. And he said, I was just trying to rattle his cage a little bit. So there's been a lot of cage rattling going on there at uh, Bristol Motor Speedway. And I guess that's part of the big draw. Now, coming up here soon is NASCAR Cup Series racing there on dirt. What's behind that? How did that come about? And what are your thoughts about them racing on dirt there at Bristol? That's kind of interesting. Some may not know, but back in, I believe it was 2001, the Speedway decided to try something like that. And they put dirt down and had the World Outlaws guys in there on a weekend. that had good crowds and they had a lot of activity and it was well received. There just wasn't an opportunity since then to attempt that again. Okay. It takes a lot of preparation, that sort of thing. And, and the Speedway, of course, itself was evolving uh, in that same time period too. So they, they had a lot of things going on that would have not necessarily interfered, but would really have strained their resources to uh, attempt something like that again. And uh, like in 2016, I guess it was, they had the University of Tennessee and Virginia Tech play football in the infield and okay. that sort of thing. And then with last year and all of the different changes that happened in NASCAR, I guess it was just the right time to attempt something like that again. And the idea was well received and by NASCAR and I think the drivers are looking forward to it. Maybe some with some trepidation. But yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll see what happens next weekend. Absolutely. Well, apparently the fans are looking forward to it too. I believe uh, I recall not too long ago you told me that uh, they're anticipating some 40,000 fans for this event. Is that correct? Yes. 40,000 was the seating capacity according to state guidelines for right now and, and they, they have been sold out for well over a, a month or more Wow! for that particular day and I haven't really heard anything concrete lately but I think the Saturday truck race is going to be well received. They're still selling tickets for it but I think they're going to have a good crowd for it too. Well it sure sounds like it and uh, I'm sure everybody's excited not only to see the guys race on the dirt but I'm sure they're excited just to get together that many people. Uh, you know, the past year has been very, very tough on racing as well as everything else in our country. And the attendance at the Speedways has been minimal. It's starting to open up a little bit. And I'm sure everybody's excited about the possibilities of being able to get some of these big crowds back together. Now, NASCAR racing on dirt, that probably won't do a lot to change the way that Bristol Raceway Ministries operates. Certainly something different for the Speedway itself. And as you said, the engineering and all the work that goes behind putting dirt on the track and that kind of kind of thing. They probably don't want to do that all the time. So it's kind of unusual for Bristol Motor Speedway, we might say. But uh, you guys have regularly been going to Bristol Motor Speedway to perform ministry for years and years. And I know the COVID-19 pandemic has had an impact on raceways all across the country, including Bristol Motor Speedway. And it certainly had an impact on raceway ministries there at the Bristol Motor Speedway for you guys last year during the 2020 racing season. But I want to talk for just a moment about Raceway Ministries with NASCAR in town at Bristol before the year 2020, before the pandemic. You guys have regularly, routinely had one of the largest Raceway Ministries operations all across the country since we've been doing Raceway Ministries work, and that's been for some 25 or 30 years officially. Um, how in the world do you guys do it? I mean, I've been up there before when y'all had as many as 300, 350 volunteers on property. Let's just talk a little bit about the intense activity and planning and work that goes into a Raceway Ministries weekend there at Bristol, apart from the pandemic. How many volunteers do y'all normally have 
And how many ministry sites, how many ministry stations do you guys have? What kinds of ministry activities? All that kind of thing. Just kind of unpackage all of that and describe that for our listeners today so they can get a feel for how big Bristol Raceway Ministries is with NASCAR in town. Okay. Well, I guess you could say not only is Bristol unique just because of its racetrack itself, but because as the track is so uh, has packaged itself uh, lately, the Glass Great College. Coliseum. We, I guess, as far as I know, uh, if not the only one, maybe one of very few tracks in NASCAR that you can walk all the way around the track under the grandstands. Yeah. So that presents some very unique opportunities. Plus, because things are kind of close around there, too, there are a lot of campgrounds very close to the speedway. I think one of the things that really drove that point home to me was several years ago, we were doing a uh, pre-race training one year back when the crowds were like 165,000 at every race. Right. The gentleman that's oversees the EMS services there during the races was doing a class for us uh, that particular day about being prepared and, and things we could do medically until someone EMS arrived. And he made the statement that if you stood right in the middle, the exact middle of the infield, and you had a one mile string and used that to make a one circle around the speedway, that on race weekend, that was the third largest city population wise in the state of Tennessee. My goodness. So that really drove home the fact that there's a lot of people out there, even when there's that many people inside watching the race, there's several thousand more out in the campgrounds sitting at their campers that just like to come and be a part of that weekend and do that sort of thing so we have through the years we started out in one campground right next to the speedway because a baptist church about five miles from the speedway the gentleman that was the music director at that point in time saw a need people were not being served and let them know about Christ. So they took a group of volunteers and just so happened that that particular campground had relatives that were members of that church. And they took a group over there on a weekend and started in that same group basically uh, is still at that same campground. Okay. Now, was that kind of the beginnings of Bristol Raceway Ministries? Yes, sir. That was the very start of it in the fall, I guess you could say the fall of the August race of 1992, I believe it was. Wow. All the way back to 1992. That gentleman moved on from that church and the next man that came in to lead the choir found out shortly after he took that position that he was also the leader of the Raceway Ministries group. Oh, surprise, surprise for him. He was there a couple, three years, I think, from that and then moved to another local church, got that church involved. A member of that church was the owner of a campground on the other side of the speedway, so that got that involved. So that started two campgrounds, and then it just blossomed from there. It was kind of one of those, um, Wow. I like to say it's one of those word-of-mouth things where you have someone that comes for the weekend and volunteers. You go back to work on Monday, and somebody says, what did you do this weekend? And they tell them what they did. And, they, well, I'd like to be involved in that. So it just kind of ran on from there. And at our high point, I guess, uh, pre-pandemic, we were in 14 campgrounds around the Speedway, uh, providing Sunday morning services in the spring race and in a, a service on Saturday morning at the August race and helping people there. Then we started out, I guess, those two campgrounds. One thing led to another. Another, we were able to get on the speedway property itself. They started out, they had some chaplains that were able to go inside around the uh, concourse where you walk around the, under the grandstands and had some men that were stationed there during the race to see to the fans' needs and had um, one large tent under the grandstands where there was tables set up and uh, volunteers manning it where we gave out Christian literature and Bibles and that sort of thing. And it's been really interesting because as you said the way people have uh, reacted to Bristol itself and when there was the 160 plus thousand people coming and you like you said it was tickets were hard to come by and there was even stories told of Bristol tickets being passed down in wheels and as a point of contention in divorces and that sort of thing that's amazing tickets then were so hard to come by the waiting list was I think it as I recall that one year the late waiting list was like two years to even get so um, it led to a lot of different things. We started out, like I say, with just a few volunteers under the stands. That expanded. Then in, um, now I think it was the early 2000s, 
when they redid, as a part of redoing the track and putting the concrete down, they redid the backstretch grandstands from, from concrete grandstands to the all metal, all aluminum stands and put in a new upper deck, all of that. So that actually, at that point, secured to where you could actually, without difficulty, walk all the way around the speedway uh, under cover. Well, you know, I've noticed through the years, not only has Bristol Motor Speedway become a big draw with very, very supportive fans who are excited to be there, but in the same fashion, Raceway Ministries has been embraced by the fans. They seem to love and respond well to all the things that you guys do. I know, gosh, 14 campgrounds. And I love the way that you've described how that evolved. It wasn't like y'all went out to Bristol Motor Speedway to suggest a a plan or a strategy to the staff and get their approval. It just kind of evolved over a period of time and spread from one campground to another. And then as the track grew and as they developed their own plans for the facility itself, uh, you guys have been able to penetrate the area under the grandstands all the way around. And there's lots of activity that goes on there. You know, out in the campground, you guys are very active, like you said, with worship services, and you also have had concerts. You've had hospitality locations where people can come and get coffee and cookies and sit down and have conversations and just visit. But then up under the grandstands, as I recall, there have been times where you had four or six different stations under the grandstands where you had volunteers that handed out literature. They were there available to help fans find their way around. You've had chaplains stationed all under the grandstands. You've had chaplains stationed up in the grandstands in each one of the corners. I even recall music concerts being performed under the grandstands from the stairwell and uh, the fans just gathering in and having a good time. So with all the excitement of racing, uh, you guys have become a very popular part of the program, so to speak, there at Bristol Motor Speedway during race weekends. Would that be something that you would agree with? Oh, yes, sir. That's one of the things that this continues to to amaze me how many people, uh, especially, and like I say, you've got these folks that have had tickets and still have tickets from years and years, and they have gotten used to, we have our tents under there in pretty much the same location every race. And these folks come and they sit in their seats and they come around and they look to see what uh, materials that we have. You know, uh, we try to have something different to give out during each race, but we have uh, some things that we keep because it's they're very popular, but we do have people that walk up just to make sure that we're there and that they can count on us. It's been really gratifying, I guess you could say, to participate in that because folks in this day and age, when they search you out for things where the gospel, I guess you could say, and Christianity in particular is not particularly well received in other places, but at the racetrack, folks are looking for us. They're glad to see our tents up, to see our folks in their blue shirts and know that someone's around there if they need help. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I wonder many times, uh, how do you know when you have reached some level of success in ministry? You know, how do you know when you're being effective? How do you know when you're getting a response from what you do? And I guess one of the indicators would be exactly what you just said. When you become an essential part of the program there, so to speak, to the point that the fans are looking for you and they're anticipating you being there and they're depending upon the services that you provide, that's kind of a, a, a measure stick, I think, to help you know that you're being effective, that you're being well received, and there's being a response there. You know, sometimes it's hard to measure effectiveness in ministry because it's so intangible. You know, you can talk about statistics, you know, how many people accepted the Lord, how many Bibles did you hand out, that kind of thing. But when you just have that general feel from the people that you're an essential part and they're anticipating and depending upon you being there, that says a lot about the effectiveness of your ministry there. Uh, So I share your excitement. Uh, Wow, you know, that That's got to be very gratifying to know that the people are anticipating you being there. What are the things, the specific things that they are depending upon you for? I mean, what are they looking to you and anticipating that you're going to provide once they get there to the raceway? They look over there and they see that raceway ministries tent and they go, ah, I'm glad raceway ministries is here. Uh, What are they anticipating? What are they expecting from you guys? Uh, We kind of touched on there a few minutes ago about just being uh, there 
there to help someone. I mean, it's the little question. Somebody comes in to the track and they've got their radios and their electronic devices. And I don't know how many times I've been under there right. and someone come up and want to know where can I get batteries and, or where can I get this and where can I get that sort of thing. Okay. And, that, and that's kind of a public service, I guess. But then you've also got the folks that depend on you being there in a time of trouble. It's kind of eased up some, but back in the day, I guess, and to use that quote, when there was so many people there, every race, we went through a period of time there in the 2000s where at every race, there was at least one heart attack amongst the fans. They came to depend on us for the support during those difficult times. One of the services that we provide during a race weekend is we have carts that help the handicapped and disabled folks around the track, and we the EMS folks that are there at the speedway, they have six, call them fan care centers spaced around the speedway. And when someone gets sick, okay. for whatever reason, uh, they can take them, EMS can take them to this fan care. And they're kind of like a mini ER without the machinery or whatever you want to say. If something's needing a special care or something, they can take them to the local hospital. Then we get involved, kind of helping the family get back to their vehicle or help them get to the hospital or, you know, whatever's needed. Needed. And that's kind of one of the things that I'm pretty much involved with. I work with the EMS guys, and that's another indicator, I guess, where you can say that your ministry is working. The EMS people have an early morning meeting on race day to get their assignments and their marching orders, I guess you could say, for the day. And the gentleman that leads that, I'm usually there for that meeting, and he tells those folks that most of the time he'll introduce me and have me say something, and he tells them that without Raceway Ministries, they couldn't do what they do. Wow, that's a pretty good affirmation right there. Because you know, it's, if you go somewhere, whether it's your first time or your 10th time or whatever, you don't always know where everything is at. So that becomes a time when someone gets sick or hurt or whatever, and there's a really great need if there's someone there to help assist that family person, whatever, during their time of need, that really counts. It really does. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you get 160,000 people together, stuff that's going to happen. You know, people are going to get hurt. People are going to get sick. They're going to get death notifications. They're going to get all kinds of things. And what a great opportunity for Raceway Ministries to be able to step in and serve in the name of Jesus and offer some Christian compassion, offer them prayer, uh, share the gospel with them, walk them through a crisis. And many times it's in the midst of those crisis times that people find mm-hmm. the Lord. That is so, so essential. Now, obviously then, you guys have great relationships with EMS. And my feeling is from past experiences there, you guys have excellent relationships with the staff there at Bristol Motor Speedway. I know Jeff Bird, a longtime president of the Speedway, was a great friend of Raceway Ministries, but I sense that even beyond that, you guys have had wonderful relationships with all the staff there at the Speedway. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, it's kind of evolved over the years. When it first started, there was some a great deal of trepidation. They, they just weren't real sure what a Christian organization, what benefit that was going to be and we just kind of have through the years you offer your services uh, we're there for you if you need us uh, and then whenever something happens and they ask can you do this and majority of the time we have been able to provide that service so it has kind of evolved through the years to where the point now where they know what we can do so Good. they more depend on us now than they do the other volunteer group because they know that if they ask us to do something we will do it as they wish and without a okay. conflict, without a bunch of stuff going on and get the job done and take care of things. And our relationship with the gang there at the Speedway is really good. Jerry Caldwell now is general manager. Uh, Jeff passed away a few years ago. Right. Jerry is his son-in-law and took over that, and he's a real good supporter of ours. Good. Has helped us out on a couple of things, and the whole gang at the Speedway looks to us for help and support, and there's other activities that go on at the Speedway where they count on us for help moving people around and that sort of thing. Okay. We have a really good relationship. There's been bumps in the road, of course, just like anything. Oh, yeah. And we've worked through that. We get along well with everybody there. There's been situations where things have happened at the track with the staff itself, situations that weren't very good, and we've had people come over there and pray with them and help them through these hard times, and they certainly appreciate us being there for whatever need there might be. I'm sure they do. 
Well, you know, it's a great insight, Butch, because from my viewpoint, you guys just have had great relationships with the staff, but according to what you just described, hadn't always been that way. And it took time to build trust. And I think that's something that people need to understand. When you walk as a Christian organization into a secular entertainment environment, uh, there probably will be some skepticism, some hesitation, and a lot of wondering, what in the world can these Christian guys have to offer that's going to help us out in what we're trying to do? And like you said, I like the way you described it, fear and trepidation. You know, when a Christian organization walks into a secular environment, there can be a lot of trepidation on the part of the secular people you know, who are trying to run the entertainment industry. What can these guys do for us? But over a long period of time, you guys have proven yourselves. You've been trustworthy. You followed through with things that you said that you would do. You've been available whenever they had a need and you've gone, you've met that need and satisfied that need to the point that they have trusted you and wanted you back again and again. That's another great indicator that you're doing the right thing. And that's not an easy thing to do and it doesn't happen quickly. So my hat's off to you guys for a long-term good relationship with people that has evolved over a period of time by gaining trust with those people. Now, what you've described has been pretty characteristic of non-pandemic NASCAR weekends there at Bristol. Huge events, large crowds, 160,000 people gathered into that last great coliseum, that place where Rubbin's racing the world's fastest half mile and all this ministry activity going on in 14 campgrounds and in stations all around the grandstands where you guys represent the Lord to the fans. But what about last year? Pandemic came and it really put the brakes on a lot of things that have to do with racing to the point that many races last year, there were no crowds there at all. So how did that impact Bristol Raceway Ministries last year? Very much. Um, yeah. They had a thing at the Speedway in one of their buildings on property there, a dinosaur show, I guess is the way it was a build or something like that. But it was on a weekend and we were there with a few of our carts helping folks getting back and forth to the parking lot and that sort of thing okay and then this was the first weekend in march last year and then the next weekend was when they shut everything down right and we didn't do anything at all anywhere until june when they brought the all-star race back wow with about 20 or twenty-five thousand fans they i think they let in that particular uh, weekend and okay all that we got to do uh, was use our golf carts that we have to move the handicapped and disabled Disabled up to the speedway itself out of their parking lot had to do a lot of cleaning and disinfecting between each passenger and oh, okay. that sort of thing sure that was well received folks Good. were glad for the service and we were able to provide that then things kind of started back up after that you know and they were NASCAR to their credit I guess was very particular about what they wanted to happen in and around a speedway during a race weekend to uh, alleviate this COVID stuff we didn't do anything else again until the September race same thing again just helping folks get from point A to point B that were uh, incapacitated. Uh, we could not, at either time, could not hand out literature or anything like that, you know, just sure. the COVID itself thing. And that's basically all we did last year. Okay. So nobody in the campgrounds, probably. Yeah, nobody in the campgrounds. Wow. Uh, one of the campgrounds was it's right next to the Speedway. They used it as, as some... Uh, satellite parking and that sort of thing. Okay. So that folks, they just basically walked across the bridge to get into the speedway. Right. We didn't have anything to do with that. It was to the point, you know, where there was a lot of things that you couldn't do, but there's a few things that you could do. And we helped them out there and got through all of that. And that was basically the what we did last year. Okay. There's there's some things that we do away from the speedway that we weren't even able to do that. We have, in the last three or four years, provided a service at a local university uh, during their football weekends okay in the fall yeah um, helping the handicapped and disabled folks uh, get from point a to point b and, and they didn't play football there last fall so we didn't do, get to do that and we've taken advantage of what few opportunities that we have but yeah hopefully this year we'll get back started a little better well the opportunities last year were few and far between and i'm sure it was a shocker for folks like you because you're so accustomed to being involved in so many different activities during race weekend and i'm sure that has caused a lot of anticipation on the part of your uh, ministry team to look forward to 2021 and what might be able to happen this year 
So looking at this year, what is the game plan and what is the strategy for ministry during the 2021 season? Are y'all going to be back up to 14 stations in campgrounds? Are you going to be with all the stations under the grandstands, chaplains in the corners up in the grandstands? I mean, at what level are you guys going to be able to operate in ministry terms the upcoming dirt race and then on down into the season what's going to take place there what do y'all have planned um at this uh, dirt race we'll be back with our carts uh, helping the handicapped and disabled but okay other than that we won't have a presence up and under the grandstands for this particular race uh, okay still got things scaled back on that particular aspect sure and basically i guess that's due to local and state restrictions at this point in time uh, right we are back in two campgrounds good the two campgrounds the original one where we started and then the one where we went into the second one they're on each side of the uh, each end of the speedway i guess you could say okay those two because the crowd's going to be just a little bit larger sure uh, approximately forty thousand. we anticipate those two campgrounds because we had been in there for so many years they reached out to us uh, could you please come and at least offer a sunday morning worship service good good and uh, be there for the folks we found out after the fact i guess last september that there were a few uh, a few campers not many but the folks that were there were looking for us wow good where's the raceway ministry oh my there's a couple of especially the where we started in all american campground has been there so long and have done such a wonderful job and have developed some relationships with some long-term fans there that have really benefited us in a couple of different ways but when you have people that come looking for you uh, i believe you can say that you have been doing your job and, and done it quite well absolutely yeah yeah well another great indicator that ministry is needed uh, at the speedways and another great indicator that you guys have met the needs and built a great trustworthy reputation uh, representing the lord jesus out there with the people well, it sounds like it's going to be a, maybe a, a year of improvement with maybe less COVID. Maybe things will improve. Maybe the racing will pick up in terms of attendance, and maybe the ministry opportunities will enlarge as well. But it sounds like you guys are ready to expand with it. Now, I've got to ask you this. You guys have been participants with National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries for a long time. We've had great, strong connections with you folks there in Bristol and have had a variety of people from your ministry team to represent your ministry team on the board of directors with National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries and attendance at our meetings and doing some of our training sessions and lots of different things. Can you describe a little bit the value of participating with Raceway Ministries? What kind of benefits have you seen from being a part of, uh, for example, the National Fellowship of Raceway Ministries? Well, I guess the best thing is probably just the networking with everybody at these other tracks. Sure. We have, in years past, you know, we've been to the national meetings and been able to hear uh, other folks talk about what they do and it kind of gives you an idea of maybe a different way to present yourself or a different way to do things sure or something that you've not been doing that would work where you are and it all comes together in, in the end where people are led to the lord right um, i know a few years ago uh, i believe it was the national meeting that was in nashville uh, one of our folks was there and got to talking to somebody from i don't know if it was from another speedway or from some uh, body that was there provide, showing what service they provided but uh, were able to connect up with them and led to us being able to buy some Bibles because we give out a, a lot of Bibles on a weekend. Good. Good. One of the things that we were able to do uh, several years ago, we got to the point, and everybody in the fellowship will go along with this, God gives you so much, and you try to do the best you can with it, and you don't want to waste those resources. Uh, we had gotten to the point where the Bibles that we were giving out, even though they were very good Bibles and were real received, the uh, cost was starting to be a point to where we weren't real sure you know, if we were going to be able to come up with enough money to buy enough Bibles and got to looking into maybe that we could come up with something else and found this resource to where they would print Bibles for us with a custom cover. So the, I think it was 2016, the track celebrated their 50th year in operation. Okay. We were able to print a Bible, a New Testament, a NIV version that we were able to give out. The Speedway gave us pictures and things. They were very uh, helpful. Good. Uh, the artwork and that sort of thing 
their PR department helped us out a great deal on that with artwork and those kind of things. And we had a logo on there celebrating that particular event. We gave away more Bibles that particular race than we ever have. Oh, I bet you did, yeah. Because people wanted a quote-unquote Bristol Bible. Oh, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Wow. That's just one of the things that we have done. A, a benefit that from being in the fellowship where you get other ideas and you find out if there's other resources out there. Somebody might be giving away something that would work quite well with where you're at. Sure. It's, it's a great benefit from being a part of a bigger group where you get ideas from everybody or resources. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we exist is to encourage each other, pray for each other. A lot of camaraderie, a lot of good fellowship with each other, but the connections and the idea exchanges and the resources that we share with each other, very, very valuable. And I have to tell you that we as a national group have learned a lot and we have benefited greatly from our connection with you guys there in Bristol because with the ministry that you guys have going on there, all the activities and the number of volunteers and the number of opportunities that you have to be able to share the Lord, you guys have learned a lot and you have a lot to share and a lot of our other Raceway Ministries teams have benefited from it greatly. So great observation there, Butch. Appreciate that so much. Any final thoughts that you might have to share with people? You just, like everything else, I guess you pray for opportunities where the Lord would lead you, the things to do and opportunities to do it. We hope uh, later this year that things open back up, but we will continue on with whatever, wherever the Lord leads us. That's been one of the, I guess, maybe a hallmark of what has gone on in Bristol. The Lord's opened the door. We've stepped through it in faith, and He's led us through it, and things have gone quite well. Yeah. Like I say, there's always, no matter what happens, there's always a speed bump in the road every once in a while, but God works you through it. That's right. You continue on, and by His grace, we go through each one, and everything works out. Well, I think what you just described is very characteristic of the experience of a lot of Raceway Ministry teams. Being faithful, being willing to do whatever and go wherever, whenever, in the name of the Lord, to serve the needs of people, whether the opportunities are big or whether they're small or whether they're enjoyable or challenging. Uh, Just being faithful to the task is so important, and you guys have exhibited that, and our prayers will be that God will just continue to work through you and through Bobby as you lead Bristol Raceway Ministries, and our prayer will be that you have a great, great race weekend coming up on dirt, and that the rest of the year will be wonderful as well. Well, thank you, Butch. Appreciate you so very much. Thank you for joining us today to share your thoughts and some of your ministry experiences with Bristol Raceway Ministries. I know that everyone listening is going to benefit from it. Butch, thank you so much. And to all of our listeners out there, thank you all for being a part of our podcast today. Uh, We've been talking with Butch Rhodes. Butch is co-director of Bristol Raceway Ministries, and they have a fantastic Raceway Ministries team up there in Bristol, Tennessee at the Bristol Motor Speedway. And if you want to check them out a little bit closer, uh, buy you a ticket to a Bristol race and then go out and experience Raceway Ministries. They're a big part of the program there, and I know that you'll enjoy it and learn a lot from it. But to all of our listeners, thank you so much for being a part of our Raceway Ministries Today podcast. We wish you the best as you continue to travel down the road course of life, and we look forward to seeing you in Victory Lane at some point along the way. And we hope that you'll join us for our next broadcast of Raceway Ministries Today. Well, thanks so much for tuning in for today's podcast. We'll look forward to having you join us for the next edition of Raceway Ministries Today. Today.